Thank you for being patient. Uh, this is The Writer's Journey, the show where we are on a journey to learn more about writing success together. So thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the inimitable Kayleen Williams. And tonight we're talking about dictating your next novel. This episode is brought to you by Gravity Cities Magazine, which is out now. Our guest is the author of over 165 books and 15 million words, most of them written by talking into his recording device as he hikes trails near his home in the Rocky Mountains. Turns out he's pretty good at spitting tales out loud because he has won or been nominated for a slew of awards, including the Hugo, Nebula, Bram Stoker Awards, and New York Times Notable Book. Fans of the Dune Saga will recognize his name as he's co-written 14 Dune books along with Brian Herbert and written many other science fiction, fantasy, steampunk, and superhero novels as well. Many of his villains make for excellent dictators, and he'd like to help you become a dictator too. In fact, he wrote a whole book on it. Kevin J. Anderson, welcome back to the show. Glad to be back here. Thanks for having me on, and, and I can talk about being a dictator. Yes. What is this book that you have to show us? So let me just show it in front of the screen here. There we go. Um, I, I do all my writing by dictating. I have a, a digital recorder, and I go out hiking, and, and I have my notes with me. I just go out, and I'll do 4,000 words a day pretty much every day. That's, that's sort of two chapters worth. I go out in the morning, and I do that. And I've learned how to do that for man, probably since 1990 or something like that. That's when I got into uh, dictating stuff. And I realized that it really helps my productivity. It helps my, uh, my sensory writing, my descriptive writing. It sure helps my dialogue because the characters are talking because I'm talking. Um, you know, when you type things, you can type things that no human being would ever say. And when you're speaking it, you'll know that, wait, that was five words that started with the letter S all in a row. And that doesn't sound right. Um, Anyway, so I, I've done this for a very long time, and it's just one of those things where writers always get asked, you know, where do you get your ideas? And people come up to me and they go, well, how on earth do you dictate? And I got kind of tired of explaining it over and, <laughs> over, and over and over and over again. So I finally decided, well, it's time for me to just just write it up in a, in a book on all the various techniques. And uh, one of my Padawans in dictation is Martin Shoemaker. He's, uh, he's won the Writers of the Future Award, and he's published a bunch of short stories in the major magazines. And, and he's got, in fact, we're publishing a collection of his stories coming out soon. Um, but he also, once he started it, he just became this full-fledged evangelist for, for dictating. But he does it differently than I do. And as we were meeting at the Writers of the Future Awards last uh April, I think it was, I, I said, you know, we really should write this down. I'm tired of people asking me about this stuff. And we kind of brainstormed right there, the table of contents and uh, went back to our separate quarters and we dictated our chapters, of course, and transcribed them and got the book done in about a month. So it's been out for a couple of months. Um, see, the, Martin, the difference with Martin is he does all of his stuff while driving because he's got an hour commute to work every single day. And he realized that listening to talk radio or listening to classic rock music was great, but it didn't get any writing done. And then he was listening to audiobooks, which is also good. It gets you caught up. But that's an hour worth of writing every day that he could be doing. And once he taught himself how to, he's got a whole setup in his, in his car that can record it while he's, so he's not like driving off the road when he gets to an exciting part or something. And that's really, really helped him. And mm -hmm. we just have... There's as we started writing everything down, there are just so many different reasons for doing this and so many advantages that uh, we just kind of fleshed out chapter after chapter. And and uh, I've heard all the people who come up and complain to me over the years of, oh, I tried it for four minutes and I just couldn't get into it. And I went, yeah, sure. And when you sat down at the keyboard, you tried it for four minutes and then you stopped. And you know that's that's one of the the lamest excuses that I can hear. And you know, I, I just don't like it when people say, I, I tried it for five minutes. Well, it's a learning curve. You have to try it. You have to keep at it. And I, I propose some techniques about how uh, you can get started on it, how you can like put training wheels on and get some things done. So I'm sure we'll talk about that over the course of the hour. Yeah, I like that you brought up training wheels. I, I read your book 
I loved it. I loved that you had uh, two different authors giving their own experiences and they're so different. And and Martin, especially, most of our audience are in shoes similar to Martin's. We've got a different job. Uh, We've got family responsibilities. We have very limited time. And sometimes that time that we're spending in the day that's so precious is spent in the car or in the subway, Uh in the bus. And we want to redeem that time and do something useful with it. He had a two hour commute. So what are you gonna do with that time? He wanted to write. And so he ended up writing thousands of words a day because he could speak it into his headset and record it all down. And and in your book, he kind of like lays out exactly how to do that step-by-step and with what tools and what the process looks like. well, one of the one of the big things that I like to say is that if you if you approach dictating your fiction as I'm going to sit down and and just dictate finished perfect prose the first time, um, no, that's just never going to happen. But still got to get through the vomit draft. That's true. Well, but when you're typing it, you don't do it right the first time either. I mean, um, it's look. I've had people tell me that that. Um, Dictating just doesn't seem doesn't seem natural. The thing that seems natural for as far as communicating and telling stories is by by typing them. And I go think think about the process that you've got going on there in in your head. If you are typing the words that you're thinking up, your brain is thinking up that sentence, and then it breaks it down into individual words, mm-hmm. and it breaks those words down into individual letters that make up those words. And your brain sends a signal to your fingers to move across this randomly arranged keyboard to reconstruct the word L, uh, the letter L, the letter A, the letter U, the letter R, the letter E, the letter N. And then it appears on your screen. And they say, that's more natural than me just saying, Lauren, there's a lot fewer steps to dictating. You think up the sentence, it comes out your mouth. And we'd all know people that think of things and it comes out their mouth without them going through any kind of filtering process or anything. But uh, so, so from there, I'm going to interrupt you just a little bit. Um, there are those of us authors out there who don't like hearing us hearing ourselves talk, um, or like what Bart of today um, had asked, what advice would would Kevin give to someone who wishes to dictate but has terrible um, trouble speaking clearly, mumbling, running words together? Um, well, yeah. see, here's one of the things that if you're if you're mumbling and you're not very clear, or you, you could have a speech impediment. There could, there are plenty of reasons why it might not be clear uh, in your in your dictation. That can be difficult if you're trying to use a speech recognition thing, like say Dragon Naturally Speaking or some other uh, other things. Uh, other than to try to train yourself to enunciate more clearly, like like watch the movie My Fair Lady a couple of times. I mean, that's I, I don't want to be uh, glib about how easy it is to train it, but it is a if you are dictating, it's like you are giving a, a a performance. You are you have to speak clearly enough in order for either your typist to understand what you're saying or for the speech recognition. On the other hand, though, um, you can just do this for yourself. And that's one of the, the big first steps that I try to emphasize to people is just use it as like a note-taking device. Use your digital recorder and go out and, and I, I love brainstorming characters or brainstorming plots that way. That if I'm just starting a brand new book from scratch and I've got kind of this vague idea of, of Game of Thrones only on a world that has clowns, you know, who, I don't know. Um, and... and I've got to have, I'll have five characters. And Could you imagine the balloons? Yes. And, and well, where do the balloons come from? And who does their makeup? And you, so you just start asking these questions. Um, I mean, just here's your main character. And, and so you start as a, maybe not a stream of consciousness, but they don't have to be complete sentences. They don't have to be um, finished, polished prose. This is just for you to get down your ideas of, Here's the character, and 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 she's got two brothers and and a younger sister who died in a horse riding accident when she was five, and and that drove the mother over the edge, and the mother ran off with a different clown in the circus or something like that, um, and, and you just it doesn't have to be permanent. This is something for you, 
And one of the things that I always intrinsically knew, but what we researched for the, the On Being a Dictator book, is there's countless studies that show that your creativity is increased when you're moving and walking and doing something. So if you're outside just kind of strolling along the bike path or walking along a river or in a forest or, or I, I find that I can't do it in like in Manhattan, some big, loud, busy city streets that just doesn't do it for me. But, but it's proof that you are more creative if you're walking around, if you're just, mm -hmm. if there's some motion and I'll, I'll be kind of self-serving. I love to hike. That's what I'd rather be doing most of the day is out in the mountains and climbing up by waterfalls and stuff. And this way I can do my writing while I'm out doing something else that I love to do. So it's, it's, that's one thing. Another thing I kind of hinted earlier on, if I'm actually out and I'm in an environment that has all kinds of sounds and smells and, and, and uh, sensations around me, I will remember to put sensory details into my descriptions. Right. Yeah. But if I'm just sitting in my sterile room and I'm trying to imagine this rainforest where giant cockroaches are attacking people, well, I might not think about what the mulch looks like under their feet and what it smells like and the sound of the water trickling off the leaves in the canopy overhead and stuff like that. But when I'm out in, in nature, I get that stuff. Now, I've done... Uh, a bunch of dune plotting while I was out in Death Valley or while I was on the uh, the Great Sand Dunes National uh, Park here in Colorado. Uh, I've been out uh, snowshoeing, crunching up in the Sierra Nevada mountains after a big snowfall, writing a scene set on a polar ice cap for one of my Star Wars books. It's just being out there on the snow, I could I could smell the snow crystals, I could see the sunlight reflecting off of them, and, and you could kind of feel how new fallen snow sort of puts a um, almost like a, a sound dampening blanket over everything. So it seems quieter up there after a snowfall. And these are little details that you just wouldn't get if I'm just sitting in my office. Yeah, it's easy for us to skip over the sensory details. When we're writing a book, a lot of us focus on dialogue and action, you know, saying what exactly happened. But it's those sensory details that really... Uh, clue into the reader's brain and connect them, put them into the scene and light their imagination on fire. If you want to create empathy with the character, if you want to transport the rear into your world, it's those sensory details that get them there. And if I'm always in my office, I'm not going to be thinking about what it feels like to be in the Arctic or on a sand dune. Right. I don't know, I'm not there. You are, that's the cool thing. Yes. Well, and it's it's those specific sensory details. Like if I'm like if I'm on a sand dune, uh, if if you haven't walked on open sand dunes, you don't understand just how hard it is to walk on the sand. That's just like <laughs> sink into it, and it's like one and a half steps for forward and one step back, and you it's keep burning doing that. on the thighs, man. <laughs> yeah, and so. If I'm writing these scenes in, in Dune with, with Fremen trudging along the sand, they better be hard or they high, uh, tired or they better have some really wicked quads. I mean, that's, this, is, this is what happens when you're walking in loose sand all the time. And if you haven't done that, you don't – I mean, I'm not saying that you have to do everything you write about. I mean, if people writing serial killer thrillers, I would rather you didn't do – personal yeah. research and stuff. There's like documentaries that. that you can watch and get visual sensory yes, and all. reiterate it. So. But, but I just, I love the, um, I, I love the activity of writing going out and, and let's face it, it, it helps keep me healthier. I'm exercising every day and, and um, I'm going to see beautiful places. I live in Colorado, so there's all kinds of national parks and mountains and trails and um, beautiful stuff. But um I'm sure there's someplace interesting, no matter where anybody lives, that you can go, even if it's just like the bike path around the park or um, something where you can move and do stuff. And I do, I do want to add real quick, um, when you had mentioned, you know, dictation does not necessarily have to be the words that go down on your page. They're not necessarily, you know, that first draft. They can be that bits of the outline. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. That's one way that I actually use it. I have, you know, an old school, you know, hit, play, and record huh. stop type recorders um, for when I'm driving because it's much safer than 
hitting a scrap of paper and trying to write on it yes. um, on my, you know. Or texting it to yourself. Right, yeah. Um, so, you know, that's what I do when I get like a flash uh, idea when I'm driving. It always happens in the morning on my way to my day job. Um, I get that recorder and it's just, you know, whatever little quick bits, that's exactly how my brain is thinking. And then once I get to a place where I'm stopped, I can hit play, write that out, and then get to go and vomit. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and, and how many times have you been in a situation where like you've, you've had this confrontation with somebody and of course you screwed it up and then you have that, you redo that argument over and over in your head. Right. Many yeah. times, right. But yeah. you know, in, in, after like two or three days, I won that argument. I got this perfect argument and all the dialogue down. But 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 when it was really happening, I probably said something like, "Oh yeah, well you're a dummy too." You know that that's kind of all that comes out when you're really doing it. But I find that if you have like a, a big conflict scene where you're having characters a uh, big argument that their uh, their relationships breaking up, something like that that if you dictate, you could like practice having that argument from both sides. And that turns out to be really good, good dialogue that you can then uh, transcribe it yourself. You don't have to have, um, I don't use a uh, dragon or a speech recognition thing. Martin does all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I use an, an actual uh, human transcription service where I send the, the audio, audio files in and then somebody types it and sends back a word file um, that costs more because it's taking somebody else's time. But if it was the time for me to transcribe it, I could be writing a new chapter in the time it takes me to transcribe an old one. So I would rather create something new. Um, but I do, like for some of my really sloppy notes or something, I often transcribe them myself just because I, I rewrite it all the time as I'm transcribing it. So I wanted to test it out. I, I was reading your book and I was excited to just try it. Okay. So what I did was I downloaded um, speech texter onto my phone and you just, just talking to your phone. And I, I walked around the neighborhood like this, like it's like an old timey recorder. And then after, you know, 45 minutes I was done and I had pretty much garbage on my, on my phone. Like it was, it was so bad. I realized, wait a minute, I could have just talked like a normal person on my phone the whole time and it would have been fine. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I had 500 words that I would not have had otherwise. I had ideas that I would not have gotten otherwise. And speech texter allows you to just uh, email it to yourself and it showed up in my inbox. I put it in my word doc, fix it all up and I used it. So that I was able to use in the end. Well, just on, on the equipment question, um, you can get a lot of digital. I mean, you probably have something on your phone, like, like Lauren just said, but you also have, um, let's see, you can get these really cheap, like memo recorders. It's like 30 bucks or something. You can get your own little recorder. That's a digital recorder. Um, use that maybe for practicing. If you're, if you're going to get serious about this, you need to have a more expensive one because the, those memo recorders have a capacity of like 15 minutes or something like that. So that's not going to be enough if you're out there doing, doing a chapter or something. Uh, the one, the one I have is an Olympus 9,500. That's their current version. Uh, those run like $500 or something like that. But I, use, I run them into the ground. I use them for four or five years and I write, you know, 30 Lines. novels on each one before it, before it gets done. And they hold, I just, I was looking at mine. I'm about to start a brand new book tomorrow. I've got all my outline ready and, and I'm going to go up into the mountains. They have a little cabin up there and I'm going to do some hikes and I've got all my outlines set up. And I go, I'm going to start a new one. I looked and I went, oh, I hadn't deleted the files from the last three novels and they're still <laughs> in my recorder and it's still got memory capacity. So, oh, um, so it's, they can be pretty decent. See, mine's not that fancy. I, I have the little tape, you know, you get a pencil, oh. screws up. I, wow. I went, I went through many of the, in fact, when, when they were switching over to digital recorders, I, I was like, but I like my old micro cassette recorder. So right. I, 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 uh, I think my wife, Rebecca found something on a, on an office depot uh, bargain basement sale. And we bought like three cases of those little micro cassettes because I didn't want to be out of them. And then I very shortly after that upgraded to a digital recorder. So I've got a bunch of micro cassettes that I can't do anything with. But um, but one of the, I had a amusing thing with the micro cassette though, is that, um, you know, it's, it's like 30 minutes on a side or 45 minutes on a side, depending on what it is. 
And when it gets to the end of the tape, it just stops. And if you're paying attention, you'll notice that the thing stopped and the button popped out. But if you're like really into your story, you're in like some some steamy sex scene or something like that, and you're in the middle of it, and you just kind of keep talking and talking and realize that your tape has stopped. And so that's that's bad. And I had one where I was I was it was a thriller. It was like these terrorists on an oil refinery in, in Venezuela. I was like really getting into this. And I was out in this big long hike in the I think it was uh, Red Rock Canyon state park near las vegas i was out in the desert i'm hiking for miles and i'm dictating and i get to the end of the 30 minute cassette and it stops and i pop it out turn it over put it in there and i keep going i'm dictating and i'm still in the middle of this big action sequence and there's there's exploding things and airplanes crashing and 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 bullets flying all over the place and i get to the end of the 30 minutes and i stopped it and turned it over put it back in and start going for about 10 minutes and i realized that there are only two sides on a tape not three sides no so i lost about 10 minutes of what i did and that's just that, really that is the old school version of yeah. word crashing yes. for your computer yes. <laughs> yep so i didn't do that again that was my my learn my lesson the first time thing oh, man. Ben hit me right here yes but what's kind of cool, though, is that I've got, um, they're probably all, all de-resed or something now, but I, I had boxes of all my old cassette tapes, like all my Star Wars books are on those on my cassette tapes so I could play play them and listen to me fumble along. And and you know, what I think Kayleen mentioned about people who are not maybe happy with their, their voice, nobody's voice, what I hear in my head is not what you're hearing coming out of my mouth. It's just your voice sounds different. And, you know, put on your big boy pants and deal with it. I mean, it's, the, your voice is fine. Everybody's voice sounds, you know, how, however, like Kayleen's talking, that's what the rest of us hear every time we talk to you. So it's nothing so, weird about it to us. I will add to that. Um, before I started podcasting, and even sometimes still now, my voice aggravates the crap out of me. <laughs> still going into trying out narration. Um, because everybody else seems to enjoy listening to this ramble on mellifluous voice. Does. So I'm, you know, getting over it and trying to find, you know, just the joy. In, well, in the and, 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 and Martin made a point in the book. I mean, he he hates the sound of his of his voice, and he just he has to deal with it. You get over it, and you you send it to your um, your voice transcription thing. Now there's. The, the reason I like having a human doing it because I can just talk and talk and talk like I'm reading my book aloud. And the, the human type is to smart enough to know when to put paragraphs in and when to put open quotes and close quotes. And, and if I'm doing like this line of a running dialogue between two people, she knows that this person said that line and this person said the next line if they're arguing about something. But in, in Dragon or some other voice recognition thing, it just gives you this big long block of text unless you say period close quote new paragraph open quote whatever and you know once you get used to doing that it's not that difficult it seems it kind of throws me out of the zone when i'm like really really deep into my uh the chapter i'm writing i i don't even see anything around me i'm just in the middle of that story but you know, you can train yourself. I, I dictate like my texts and emails and stuff all the time. And I, I do the, you know, period, close quote or exclamation point or smiley face or whatever you put in there. I, I learned how to do that, but um, everybody has to learn to do it themselves. And I, I will emphasize again, it is a learning process. You don't go, I'm going to try dictation and, and try it for three paragraphs and decide that you can't do it and you know you you figure it out after a while right yeah so for our audience who's never dictated before most authors use um dragon naturally speaking it's yeah a, and i i have a, program. yeah it's it's a software program i have at present i have a real heartburn with it because after many generations they just about six months ago unilaterally decided oh we're just not going to support mac anymore and mm -hmm. I've used a Mac since they invented them, and and 
I, as far as I know, something like two thirds of the writers I know use Mac. So if you suddenly, if you're hooked into doing Dragon and you're dictating and suddenly it won't, it won't support Dragon on your Mac, then you're screwed. And I, yeah. I'm just like annoyed at them at a company for doing that. Cause this is of course, right when my dictation book comes out, then Dragon decides not to support Apple products. Right. Yeah. So, so, fix it, so you guys. <laughs> yeah, fix it. <laughs> so with dictation, the, the biggest thing that an author needs to be aware of is that the, the software is listening to you speak, it's writing down your words, and most of the apps out there are not hearing you properly and they, they'll write down the wrong word. They don't know punctuation, so you'll have to actually stop and say the punctuation mark that you want in there. And then, you're, of course, you're going to have to go back and fix it. Um, Dragon does the best job that we've heard of in getting your words right, but you still have to take time to train your dragon or to right. speak to it and get it to learn your words, and then it, it gets better with time. But that's well, that was, basic simplification. That was also one of the, the reasons why I didn't want to invest the time to teach my software, because like when I'm writing Dune books, just imagine how many weird words there are in a Dune books from Bene Gesserit and Arrakis and, and, and Shai oh. Halud and Muad'Dib and all these these things that I would have to train, yeah. whereas I, a, a human typist will just build up a list because the first time I'll say it, I'll spell it, and then she'll just build up a list and, and we'll be fine from that point on. Yeah. Now, okay. we're, I just I just wanted to add real quick before we go, because I know where you're going, know where you're headed, oh, you're over here, where I know where you're headed. Um, with Dragon, yeah, you can specifically um, train it to hear a specific word. So if you write fantasy, you make up strange words like one of the planets in um, one of my universes is Rohonin, right? That is not an English word. It's not a word it's going to know. So you physically go in, you type it in how it's supposed to be spelled. And then it's like, all right, say the word. And you have to be very clear, Rohonin, and make sure that you say it like that every time. Um, but in that way, that is how Dragon is learning. Every time you use it, you know, it knows when you say, it knows, especially when you are fixing things, if you have it activated, that you're not saying, what's another way for knows, N-O-S, you're saying K-N-O-W-S. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I just wanted to put that in there because you can train it to weird words and that is how it's doing that. But you have to take the time. I had a freaking book of weird words that I had to sit there and be like, Zolin, Krunti, you know, all this crap. So anyway. I don't have that kind of patience. I've got I've got chapters to write, so that just takes too long. That's a really good point, though, Kaylee. That's so I'm, I'm glad you covered that. Um, also, for word users, on the top right, right, left, right, on the top right, there's a little button with a microphone there, and you can click that and speak. And actually, for me, it does a pretty good job of picking out what I'm saying and then writing it down. You still have to say comma and period and question mark, but it it does a pretty accurate job of Trans, transcribing whatever I say. So if you're someone um, who's telling yourself, I can't dictate, I need to be able to type. Well, maybe you can dictate, maybe you can learn to dictate. And one way to get your feet in the water is on Word is just, just practice every now and then when you know exactly what you do want to say, when you know what that sentence or that paragraph is, click that little button on the top right, dictate your sentence and then move on, keep going. Or just try dictating emails or something, something that you know doesn't really matter. And that's just right. like a, a, you're on you're on your desktop computer. You got word there. You got to type this five sentence email, sure. click it, dictate it and send it off. And, and, and I do also yeah. want to point that that because of AI advancements, this stuff is getting markedly better every year. Yeah. It, um, I like two years ago or so when I first started using a little microphone button on my iPhone to dictate text, it got everything wrong. I mean, it, it didn't get, I, I had spent more time correcting it than I saved, but now um, it's just, I, I dictate a text onto my phone and it, it has learned like the names of my friends and it, and it, it learned that, um, I say Dragon Con a lot. Well, it, it puts it knows how to spell Dragon Con because it's, it's got the like a little bit. When you're typing a word and it's like, do you mean this word? Do you yep. mean this yep. word? Yeah. It, it does that with your voice. So. Yeah, and it's it's creepy. I mean, it, it's like, 
I, why don't I just go here? Let's start a chapter and just like select whatever word it says suggests for me and, and go. But um, uh, but one other thing I want to throw in there: my my wife also dictates. Uh, mm -hmm. She's uh, Rebecca Masta. She's written a bunch of the Young Jedi Knights books with me and some other fantasies. She also dictate dictates, and she does it um, because she has to. She's under duress because she ended up having. Uh, four surgeries. She had two carpal tunnel surgeries and two ulnar nerve um, replacements or relocations or something. So she is she is physically limited to the number of hours she can spend at the keyboard. So if she's writing a book, she had to train herself to use a recorder because she didn't. She had to spend her keyboard time fixing what she'd already written rather than as first draft time. Uh, what she did for a while is. She's not a hiker at all. She had like a treadmill in the office and she would just kind of stand there on the treadmill and, and dictate it. So that's another another thing. But for her, it wasn't a, a matter of choice. She had to do it because she wasn't allowed to type so much. Hmm. Yeah. So she might have, before that happened, she might have been someone who said, I, I can't do it. Um, I'm a, a visual writer. I need to type it out. I need to handwrite it. But then when you put yourself in that situation where there's a will, there's a way you do figure it out. You can learn. Right. Well, and, and that is another, another thing to keep, keep track of that you can learn it. That is something else that, that comes out, but it also lets you get, like we talked with Martin, it lets you get writing time where you wouldn't normally get anything accomplished like you're driving. But I, I want to go back to the, um, the thought that I have to see everything on the screen as I'm writing it so that I can see the words that are there. Well, I can make an argument that there's a there's an advantage to not seeing the words on the screen because I'm not going back and editing things all the time. I'm going forward with my story. I'm writing, this is the chapter, and I've got that sentence down. I'm on to the next one. And if you're if you're in the middle of this big battle scene and things are flying all over the place and you go, oh, I typed that word, I misspelled that, and you go back and you type it and then suddenly you've just tripped over your own momentum in your story. Um, your, your brain is in two different parts. It's the analytical half and the creative half. And when you're writing, you're using the creative half. And when you're dictating, you're just walking along and you're doing the creative stuff. But if you're typing it and looking at the screen and rewriting the sentence that you just typed and co correcting your typos and you're in the middle of a sentence and you're like, Darth Vader's about to reveal that he's Luke's father and suddenly you go, oh, I need to look up uh, what year Napoleon was born. And then you go and Google it and then you get distracted and you go on Wikipedia and you go all over. So there's an advantage to being out on the trail with your recorder and all you can go is forward with your story. You can't go forward and backward and forward and backward. You're, you're just plowing through. Right. Yeah. If, if this is you and you really struggle with just getting out the words to so get into the zone because maybe you're distracted by the other tabs on your computer, maybe you're distracted by the other things around you, or maybe just this process. Hey, look, a Facebook message. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe just the process of word vomit is hard for you. Like it's hard for me, right? This is something you could try. You could try and see if it works for you. All right. So before we continue, we do have our delightful show sponsor tonight, which I must say, I have peeked through this thing. It is a gargantuan amount of amazingness. Y'all need to check it out. Tonight is brought to you by Gravity City Magazine. With the world! No, I don't know. Anyway, so what is exactly Gravity City, you might be asking yourself. Inspired by police and political dramas, noir pulp fiction, and the best of Philip K. Dick, Gravity City encapsulates the grit and slime of the classics and casts them out to the dark fringes of the galaxy. On the city's resident planet, Nebuna, the lines between good, bad, and darkness and light are often as thin as a bullet's trace or the wisp of a train vapor shot from a magnum blaster. It is all the things and everything in between. Go get Gravity City Magazine, it is a digital thing. There are podcasts, there are articles by real people doing real things in the real world, talking about it. Such amazing art that is so funny, heartfelt, blow your mind. Um, and right now it's free. 
Mm -hmm. This thing is like what, like 50, 60 swipey pages worth of amazingness. Mm -hmm. um, it's only free for a limited time, and then it's going up to four ninety nine, which honestly, that's a fucking great price uh, for everything that's in it. Go check it out. Click. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I like I like the swipey pages of awesomeness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, Kayleen, you didn't think about that. Like, I write out my whole script ahead of time, and then I practice it before I deliver it. But you didn't. You just said I, it. No, okay, so I will say, okay, Lauren, Lauren, over here, makes a great point. Uh, when I am doing those show sponsors, and a lot of times now when I'm doing the end show things, I am vomiting that shit out of my mouth like yesterday's <laughs> macaroni. Because... I sit there and I'm reading it and I'm reading it and then I lose my train of thoughtness because I'm like, oh wait, no, I need to put that in there. And then I'm like, oh no, back up. And then I trip over myself and I'm just like, fuck all of it. Thank you for joining the show. And I, oh. But could you do that when you first started and when you first tried, could you just get out like swiping pages of awesomeness? No, when no. we first started this, I needed that script. I needed that script to know Thank you for watching the writer's journey. Be sure to check us out next time. And look at, I'm staring at you guys. Not no, with your the training room. wheels. <laughs> you don't need the training wheels anymore. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it definitely takes time to, to get into the groove and into, into the feel of the process. And then you just run with it. You know, you say, fuck it. My voice is what it is. My words are going to be what they're going to be. And I will, Oh, I do want to say, if you're using dragon for me, I talk really fast. And sometimes I do have a tendency to mumble and some of my words kind of come out like this. At least that's how they sound to me. Um, so for Dragon, if for me to read inspired by a police and political dramas, I would have to go inspired by police and political dramas. That's mm -hmm. what I sound like when I'm dictating to Dragon. Enunciate. Because I have to slow everything down and really pronounce the syllables. Otherwise, it comes up with kangaroos and spaghetti science, and it's just weird. But that that doesn't feel natural to me. That that would kind of throw me out of the writing process if I had to, because when I'm like in the middle of, of like big action scene, I start going faster and faster and-, and So it did, no, it totally did. It totally did. I cannot write out of my head that way. Can't do it. So this is what I do do. Um, uh, do. I like to longhand write. That's how I get a lot of my big words out. That's how I formulate a lot of plot and character development. Um, but then that is a bitch to type back in and it takes a long time to do that. So instead of typing all of this gloriousness woo, really quick back into um, the computer, I will dictate that in. I've already written it. I already know what I want to be said. All I have to do is read it. Um, and it saves me. I was just telling Ellen before the show, uh, Ellen, oh my God, I'm sorry, Lauren. Lauren before the show. <laughs> um, I mean, it would take me, you know, up to a month, you know, to retype in an entire book that I've done that way. And mm -hmm. you know, I can get it done in less than a week dictating. So it's a gargantuan amount of time saved. That's well, another. And there's another, another aspect to this. Now I've always been a, a plotter. I've always been an outliner. I, I don't, I'm not a pantser or gardener as, as uh, garden, George Martin says. I always map everything out. So if I've got a hundred chapters, I know that chapter one, this happens, chapter two, this happens, chapter three, this happens, and I know whose point of view things are from. So I, I outline this whole thing. Uh, and so every day, I mean, when I'm writing, it's basically two chapters a day. I'll go out first thing in the morning and I'll, I'll dictate two chapters. And so I'll take my, my little notes with me, a paragraph of chapter one, blah, 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 and then chapter two. So it's like a, a summary there so I know what's happening and I have that I, I literally print it out on my laser printer and I cut it up into little like a index card size thing and I carry it with me and I either I refer to it when I'm out walking but but the way this is it's kind of a, a nice compromise between plotting and pantsing because I know chapter one chapter two this is the order that things happen but and I, I talk about it in the book there it is there it's in the book um, so I've got chapter 71 is the, the prince takes his seven naval ships to try to take over this, this island that the enemy has conquered. But yeah, the enemy has 
20 ships that they're not expecting and as they're fighting with magic and then one of the ships runs against a, a reef and they all sink and so the the king has to the prince comes back home with with like two of his ships out of his 10 and it's a disaster that's what my my little one paragraph says well when i'm out writing i've got that description but then i've got to put in they're sailing in their ships and they're talking on the deck and they're getting their weapons ready and the sails are stretched and the clouds on the horizon and they're trying to get to the island and then they oh no we see that there's 10 20 ships there that they're not expecting and uh oh we didn't see the reefs and i mean you you it's the difference between having a recipe and having a, a finished cake you know it, it's a different thing and so my outline can just give me the bare bones so i know exactly like the architect, I know where to put all my walls and all the structural girders and things, but there's a whole lot of difference between just having a blueprint and putting everything out in great detail. So I can be a, once I have my little skeleton there, I can go out and be a pantser and just make up this whole naval battle because they haven't yeah. plotted it all. Yeah, I was going to say, because that sounds more like a world bare bones. I mean, nowhere in there is the different characters, what they're going through, their temperaments, what their potential individual arcs might be. You know, you can get crazy on some outlines, I can tell you what. Mm -hmm. uh, but leaving all of that open, I mean, you're out there and you're just like, Gavin was running and then he remembered when his girlfriend from the past did whatever and you're just, see, I can't, I can't do that. But you get what I'm saying. You could do that. So it's the best of both worlds. You can, you can, you plot it, but then you also have the freedom to tell this whole naval battle from scratch. And I'm making it up as I'm out there on the trail because I, I just, I know the endpoints that they're launching and they're going to get attacked and three ships are going to sink or whatever the, the outline says. But that doesn't tell you the whole detail step by step what happens. Now, one of the things that I did, and because I, we, we wanted to do something cool in this. Um, so for I've got a vampire thriller that comes out in October from Audible. It's called Steak. It's a serial killer where a guy believes in vampires, so he's killing people he thinks are vampires. So chapter one, I, I put the act. Let me find it because I can, I can read this. Um, there we go. Um, so chapter one. This this was what I wrote for my notes, my my little paragraph thing for chapter one. Uh, chapter one, Colorado Springs, majestic Pikes Peak, dusted with an early coating of snow, aspens in the front range turning gold, clear and intense blue sky, a perfect day for killing vampires. It's broad daylight, and most of most of the apartment building is empty. People have gone to work. Kids have rushed off to school. The place has an aura of brooding quiet, almost abandoned, like many residential areas in the middle of a workday. But one of the apartments is dark, and all the windows are covered with thick drapes. A hand-lettered sign on the door says, Quiet, do not disturb. Exactly the indications that Simon Helsing has come to expect. Disguised as a plumber carrying a toolkit, he sneaks up to the door of the darkened dwelling and then works quietly to break in. Inside, he sprinkles himself with holy water, dangles a cross and garlic around his neck, getting ready for the battle. When he creeps into the bedroom where he finds a man lying deeply asleep, Mark Stallings, the uniform shirt from the man's job at an all-night convenience store lies draped on a chair. Never seen in daylight, signs are obvious for those who know what to look for. Helsing has a complete file on him, did his research. Surveillance made himself absolutely sure Helsing, which we learn later is not his real name, but one he has adopted, pulls on rubber gloves. He removes a mallet and a wooden stake from his toolbox, positions it over the chest of the sleeping man. May God have mercy on your soul, he mutters, just loudly enough to wake the victim. The victim doesn't even have time to cry out before Simon lifts the mallet and drives a stake through his heart, then strikes a second time for good measure. That's actually more detailed than I usually put in, but that's, I don't know, that's like three paragraphs. So in this book, I put, I put that, that description that I took for my notes. And okay. then next, I put down exactly word for word as that word file came back from the typist, exactly the way I dictated it. And then after that, I put my final, final chapter 
that I had edited and polished and the one that's being published so that you can look at the notes, the first draft and the final draft. And I've got a link in here so that you can actually go to Book Funnel and download my original audio so you can hear me dictating this thing as I was driving along. So you can kind of see the different steps of how it goes through so that now, granted, I've done this a lot, so my dictation is, is pretty clean, but it just shows how you can go from the step of here's your outline to here's the first draft to here's the final draft. Right, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, dictation, I don't want to dictate my first draft, but I do have trouble coming up with ideas. You oh. can take your phone and you can dictate just that those notes to yourself and kind of come up with ideas but there's nothing besides you and your phone and nature, you know, to distract you. There's no Facebook, there's no Twitter or anything else. Um, there's no, no one who can walk in on you and, you know, and then just have a request. So, so it could be for brainstorming. It doesn't necessarily have to be for writing out that draft, but hey, you've got your notes there. You might as well get started with that first chapter. Uh -huh. Well, that's how I, I developed the entire technique is that I was, just doing brainstorming. I was just doing notes. And then it got to the point where I was like choreographing climactic scenes and this guy's here and then the ship comes in over there. And I started choreographing it and my notes were getting more and more and more detailed. They were effectively a first draft. And then I thought, well, why not just make it a first draft? And that's how it kind of took over from there. So you worked up to it. I worked up to it. Well, and my, my original technique was, well, I mean, it wasn't a technique. I would... Uh, I would go out just for a walk every night because I wanted to mull over what the next day's scene was going to be, or I didn't understand the character and where she was coming from or what the, what the guy's motivation was. So I would just go for a walk and mull these things over and think about, oh, well, how about if, if this is the motivation or this thing in his childhood was what inspired him to, to hate clowns. You know what? There we go. Call back on that. Um, crazy over the clown yeah, thing. All, all of this stuff. And what I would do is I would go for this walk and I'd come up with all these great ideas and I'd come running home trying to hold them all in my head so I could get them down. And then I started taking just a notebook with me, but it's a pain in the butt to try to be writing down detailed things while you're walking no, along. Yeah, that's, it's let alone driving. That's why I switched to my little tape recorder because yeah. it's, it's more safe and you get more time because you don't have to wait for stoplights to write words. But uh -huh. I will say I've gotten really good at writing, not even looking at paper. I do not recommend that. Nobody yeah, no, not while you're driving, no. No to. Yeah, Charles Dickens used to do that. He would walk through the streets of London for hours and you know listen to people and whatever. But that was how he brainstormed ideas. And that's how he came up with his books. Just imagine if he could record all that. See, he should have had a, a digital recorder. That really would have helped him out a lot. Darn it. Time travelers. Where are you? There we go. What he wrote well, is that's with a best selling book agent. right there. Travel back in time and hand Charles Dickens a digital recorder. And yeah, there you go. His tones could have been even larger. <laughs> yes. David Copperfield could have been 9,000 pages long instead. That's exactly what it needs. <laughs> 8,000 yes. more words. Okay. So I'm digging through here. We've touched on quite a lot of the questions that we had already written out. Um, which I must say, you do a fantastic job of just getting to the nitty gritty and being like, dude, what's up? Here's what you need to know. Yeah, I wrote a book on it. So I thought about all these questions to be asked for dictation. And then he just dictated to us the answers to all our questions, people. Sure. That's, That's what right. Anderson does. I just want you to know. So now we're like, we've still got seven minutes and we want to use it because he's awesome. And that's what we're going to do. Well, sure. one of the related questions we had was from Jeff Haskell, though. I think we kind of answered it. He asked, how do you get into creative mode when dictating? Well, see, that's that's one of the things that just being out walking gets me into the creative mode. And I, well, we didn't talk about this. When, remember, I've been doing this for a long time, since like the 1990s. And that was back when people really did look at you weird if you're walking along talking into something. They're like, what is that guy doing? And, and I, like, was I like doing some terrorist plot or am I just muttering something? Um, but you don't need to be self-conscious about that anymore because everybody's got a phone or a Bluetooth set or something like that. And in fact, half the time when people are talking to me, I assume that they're just talking to themselves. And, and uh, so that's, 
that's something that's not such a big deal anymore because it, when I was off on a hiking trail dictating, I mean, this was really an odd thing. People would, would stare at you, but now they, they don't care so much anymore. Um, I, I just, to me, this is how I'm wired now that in fact, it's, it's a disadvantage because if I find I've got to write maybe like a, a two page insert, cause I wanted to add something into a chapter and I'm sitting in my office and I'm thinking, you know, I really should just like go up and down the driveway, dictating it to get that two pages done and then come back and transcribe it because that's, I'm just so used to creating and writing things that way. Um, for my, uh, I'm, I'm teaching this uh, master's degree in publishing now for classes. And every week I have to do this class on some subject. And most of it's just some introductory things with links to other articles that I found that, that are doing it. But just this afternoon, I, I had to, uh, the next unit is on um, uh, religious publishing, book selling, Christian and faith-based books. And so I've got all kinds of these resources, all sorts of publishers, weekly links and different articles that I wanna have, have people reading. And I just need to write the background material. So it, it added up to like three paragraphs, but I just sat there and I went, this would be easier if I just dictated it on my way to the post office and back while I was driving. <laughs> so that's what I did. And, and it just, maybe, maybe I'm too hooked into it that way because I mean, I can sit there and type if I need so to. You have reached epic level dictate. I'm not gonna say dictator, maybe. Yes. Epic well, that, that dictator. Fire, that's dictator. Fun. All right. Well, but here's here's another another thing that I noticed when I was doing this is that not I can use little tiny snippets of time that I would never think about writing. Um, like I, I wasn't kidding. I wrote that class lesson when I drove the five miles to the post office and back. Um, I would not normally have done anything with that. I, I'm in a position where I'm often asked to write a oh some brief introduction for a new short story anthology or a um, just a, a guest blog for somebody. And this isn't much of anything. It's maybe 500 words or, or something like that. But if I'm driving to Starbucks or if I'm driving to a restaurant or something like that, and I'm in the car for 15 minutes, well, 15 minutes, that's enough for me to, um, to write um, a guest blog. You know, it, it's, and otherwise, if I don't do it during that 15 minutes when I'm driving, then that means I have to do it when I'm at my computer when I should be doing like the bigger, more substantial writing. So I find that that just helps um, accomplish things in these small little black holes of time that wouldn't normally be, be productive. And I went to pick up a, a friend at the airport uh, a month or two ago, and I, I had been asked by Tor Books to write this full guest blog on high-tech thrillers, because they just had a brand new high-tech thriller come out, and I needed to do it. Uh, they weren't going to pay me anything for it, but it was to promote my book, and I was going to put it out, and it was going to be featured on their website, and I had a book deadline, and when am I going to find time to write this thousand-word article, and wow, I had plenty of time to write it during the trip to the airport when I was picking somebody up. So I do also want to maybe elaborate a little bit more on when when you're writing those bigger works. So when you when you have your novels and your stuff going on and you know you have 30, 40, 50 chapters going into this thing mm -hmm. and you're going up into the mountains and you're doing your thing, what are some of the things that you do to prepare for that? Like you've already said that you have, you know, your note cards of, of the mini outlines. Is there anything mm -hmm. else that you do to kind of get into that groove of speaking that first draft -ness. Well, about an hour before this podcast, I did print up from my outline the first like 12 chapters of the book that I'm doing. Now that's optimistic. I doubt I'll get 12 chapters done. Although I'm going to be gone for four days and that would two chapters a day that would normally be eight chapters. And if I'm out at the cabin and I'm really hiking all day long, maybe I will get 12 chapters done. I don't know. Um, I find that, that I have the outline and what I do often when I'm going to sleep at night, I'll, I'll, before I go to bed, I'll like, I'll read the notes from tomorrow's chapters and just kind mm -hmm. of go to bed thinking of, mm -hmm. all right, so what am I going to bring into this and how am, how am I going to set the scene and where do I open it up and, and just sort of drift off thinking about it because I write the chapter 
right after I've had my coffee and breakfast and stuff in the morning. So I'll get up and, and just be there in the zone doing that. And so you sleep on it. I sleep that's on it. As the French say, sleep with it. Sure. I will say that is amazing. I sleep with my characters. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> Well, no, that's no, that's like really awesome. I do what Kevin is saying. Um, you know, people sometimes ask me, "How do you keep so many storylines in your head straight at the same at the same time?" Because I do. I have like six of them going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, well, for for one, I do have minor notes. They're very small, limited, maybe a page. Um, but I'm always thinking about them. They're on a they're on a time clock. So whatever I know, I need to do the next day or that next hour. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm washing dishes, I'm thinking about it. Um, so, well, and that's that's a good technique because what you do is, when you do have writing time, when you finally get the kids down for a nap, or you're finally sitting in front of your your computer at night because you're going to get your writing done, you don't want to sit down and go, "Hmm, let me think about this for 20 minutes," because now you finally got time to do the writing. So, right. so if you think about what you're going to write when you have otherwise unproductive time, like when you're going to sleep, when you're in the shower, you know, whatever, um, if you're thinking about writing in those times, then when you do have writing time, you can actually do the writing instead of like starting from scratch. Ooh, uh, sorry. There's like the Hulk memes going on. It's like, you know, when he's like, how do you not be so angry? I'm all I'm angry all the time. Yes. How do you stay in the zone? How do you get into the zone when you when you start writing? Yeah, I'm That's always in the zone. I'm always in the zone. Well, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Last Action Hero, there's always a man in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So this has been amazing. Did you have any last? You're over here. Did you have any last minute questions, Lauren? Um, I think we covered everything. The last question that was on my list was. How does someone fit into the routine? But I think that's that's what we just talked about is you're finding those little minutes of time that you that you have available. And in those time those moments, you're either thinking about your story, you're processing it, or you're actually dictating that story to yourself. And it doesn't have to be your final draft, it doesn't even have to be your first draft. It can just be ideas that are coming to you. You're recording them down. Uh, if you're getting them on your phone, you can email them to yourself. It's there. If you're transcribing it onto a onto a recording device, then you can listen to it later and or get someone else, pay someone else to listen to it later and get it down. Whatever it takes for you to get to that next step on your writer's journey. Right. What about you, Kevin? Ooh, camera. Do you have any final comments for our lovely viewers, listeners? Well, I'm just I'm just hoping that we can get a whole bunch of converts so that people don't ask me the questions all the time anymore. <laughs> Start dictating so you yes. can leave them alone. Well, I mean, it's it, it's it's weird to be defending it all the time because once you're doing it, it's so obvious that this is an easy way to just. We've been storytellers since before we could had a written language, right? I mean, we were find your we were, inner bard. Yes, we were always telling stories. Homer didn't write down the Odyssey; he was singing right. the Odyssey. He was telling the Odyssey. That's that's how we are. We're storytellers, and so mm -hmm. you're dictating. You are telling your story. And then somebody else turns it into words or typing. So is there anywhere our viewers, listeners can find you in your work? Unlike anyone would know where to find you, but in case there's that one person. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm okay. very, very much in the witness protection program. Nobody can find me anywhere on it, but on, uh, on Twitter, I'm, I'm the word the, and my initials, the KJA uh, on Facebook, just look for the official Kevin J. Anderson page and just send a request and I'll let you in and just look, look for my books. They should be all over the place. I've got a new high tech thriller called kill zone that came out last month. Uh, spine of the dragon came out two months before that. And of course there's, there's on being a dictator, which I can't find the camera. There it is. It's there tricky. It is. I'm being a dictator. Um, so that you can read that and, and, you know, you might, you might enjoy reading like the draft of the chapter that I just read the notes of and listening to the audio of it. And I just, there is no one way to do writing. There's lots of different ways and you should try a bunch of them and see what might work. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm very productive and I write 
all the time. And the way I write all the time is that I can use different tools depending on the different circumstances. And uh, dictation is a really important tool that uh, you should not leave out of your writer's toolkit. I completely agree. I, I have one more note to add. Um, when I first started using the dragon, I was sitting there trying to be like spouting the vomit and it just wasn't happening until I wrote it out and then spoke it with what I had written. That was my way for dictation. And then of course my vomit note says, I'm like, ooh, crazy good idea. This and this was happened and he's gonna be this and there's all this shit going on. And then I rewrite it out when I get to a place where I'm not driving. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, play with it. Find your way if you're curious there are a thousand and million one ways, probably even more so than even we have discovered for ourselves. This is just three ways, right? Because three of us, uh, of which it can be used. Um, so give dictation a try. Definitely check out Kevin's over here, Kevin's book, because uh, he's awesome and amazing. And I mean, look at that smile. How can All you know? Right. All yeah, right. Tell us how it goes. We'd love to hear your story about how it went. Yes, yes. Check out the Future PM group. Um, we are the only keystroke medium out there. We are very friendly. Uh, we have digital cookies. It's still, they're delicious. And we we have fun. And we want to hear from you, chat with you, and be friendly. Um, and, oh, I've had this thing rolling in the back of my head. And I don't want to forget it because that's one of my problems. I forget things. This voice was made for talking. That's just what it'll do. One of these days, this voice is going to talk over you. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight on Keystroke, uh, Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Be sure to check back next week. We're going to talk about some reading, writing, maybe a little singing. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Uh, yeah. For more and more, I'm Kayleen Williams. You have been chatting with uh, also Kevin Day Anderson, freaking cameras. Yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs> I lost it. Bye.